Hello to those of you who are down in Guyana who are studying along with us about how to prepare sermons or to prepare a lesson uh, that can be taught. I'm uh, glad to be with you today. I always uh, enjoy the opportunity of uh, teaching and helping you in uh, furthering your uh, abilities to uh, be able to serve God. As you're viewing this uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm uh, actually, my wife and I are in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we're there to attend a memorial service for uh, my best friend, uh, Brother John Hazlip. Uh, John was 79 years old, and on Monday he uh, went to be with the Father. He was a great Christian man. Uh, drew a lot of people to him and through him to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to be missed. Uh, and I'm uh, glad that I can uh, be there to help celebrate uh, his life uh, on Saturday afternoon. We're studying different types of sermons or lessons. Uh, I may refer to these as uh, sermons simply because, uh, you know, I'm a, a preacher, have been for a long time, but everything I say about preaching is also adaptable to um, teaching a lesson. So, uh, ladies, uh, you can use these same formulas to put together lessons that uh, you can uh, teach uh, to other ladies, uh, teach to children, uh, whatever. Uh, these will be uh, good for you as well. Last week we uh, looked at um, a topical sermon, and we saw how you can take a topic and you can develop that topic um, you know, so that it can be uh, taught. Topical sermons are, without a doubt, the most popular uh, lessons or sermons uh, that are preached. And uh, there's a, you know, an inexhaustible uh, number of topics that uh, you can talk about. So that's one of the reasons that uh, this type of sermon is uh, so important. Now today we're going to be talking about textual sermons. And we'll look at some things uh, about uh, these sermons or lessons that uh, is important for uh, us. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, I say about uh, textual sermons, uh, the reason that uh, all of our sermons shouldn't be topical sermons, uh, a textual sermon uh, gives us a, a different type. And it keeps us from uh, the monotony of one type of sermon or one type of lesson. And different styles of preaching and teaching uh, help us to bring a freshness uh, to our audience. And also uh, it helps us to secure their attention because they don't know exactly what we're going to deal with. Now, a textual sermon is one in which... Uh, the text uh, is going to provide both the subject and the main points for discussion. And so in some uh, instances, these are much easier to uh, prepare and much easier to teach and preach than what a topical sermon is. There's a lot of value in textual lessons, and um, you uh, are able to... Uh, look at, uh, you know, the biblical uh, concept of a, of a passage, usually a smaller uh, text, but it gives you all of the foundation as well as the framework for the lesson that you're going to be teaching. It's an effective message of fulfilling what Paul told uh, the young uh, preacher Timothy when he said, you know, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So uh, this gives me the opportunity to be able to teach and to preach God's word because I'm going to the word to be able to uh, come up with what it is that I'm going to say. Usually a textual sermon 
is taken from a shorter text. Uh, sometimes one verse uh, will provide what we need, and sometimes no more than uh, two or three uh, verses to uh, be able to prepare uh, this textual sermon. And they're easier to prepare because everything is right there in the text. So uh, we'll be talking about some of these things and then uh, you have a copy of a textual sermon that you can go over and uh, see what it is that we're talking about. Now there are some liabilities in uh, textual lessons or sermons. Uh, you might limit the text. Uh, you may, you know, pervert the passage because you just take out a few words that you think uh, might be uh, salient to the uh, subject, and you've got to be careful about that. You don't want to, uh, you know, strain any aspect uh, to get a main point. And, uh, for example, uh, in 1 John 4 and verse 16, uh, if you have your Bibles, you might turn over there real quick and we'll look at uh, that passage. First uh, John chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. And there's been many a times that people have preached uh, on the love of God from this passage. But, you know, there's no development within that text. Uh, now, it does, you know, talk about the love that God has for us. But uh, that would not, uh, you know, necessarily give us the uh, information and points that we want to uh, preach. Now, when we are uh, putting these textual lessons together, we're also uh, explaining to our audience what this text is teaching. And so we want to be, uh, uh, you know, honest with what is there and not stretch the truth of these things. There's a passage, we won't go there, uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. And many a sermon has been preached on um, the glories of heaven from this passage. But, you know, that's not what it's really teaching. What it's teaching is the blessings that are found in God. And that's what we would want to deal with in a lesson like this. Now, uh, we have to be careful that we don't overemphasize a relatively unimportant aspect, you know, of a subject. And that can happen uh, if we're not careful in selecting a text and uh, trying to make that text say something that maybe it doesn't say. Uh, we might fail uh, in doing this uh, to be able to reveal the uh, basic unity of the text and uh, that is we emphasize one point over another point and we want to be careful you know not uh, to do that so these are some of the liabilities of uh, textual sermons be careful when you're uh, selecting a text and uh, developing the lesson that you're not uh, making it say something that it really doesn't say in other words you know, uh, stay uh, with what the passage is actually teaching. So how do you prepare a textual sermon? Uh, the first thing you've got to do is become, uh, you know, familiar with the book in which that text is found. Uh, that keeps us from straining, uh, you know, some aspect of it that's not being taught. So be extremely careful uh, and make sure that you don't do that. Now, uh, look at another passage with me in uh, Titus chapter 2. We'll get an example of this. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, you know, some people take this passage and they teach on the essence of Christianity. 
saying here is what, you know, this is uh, trying to say. The theme of the book of Titus is the sanctified life of the Christian. So it would be much better to take this passage and break it down, you know, this way, uh, using the, uh, the words that just leap off of the uh, passage to us, which are, uh, we're to say no to ungodliness, uh, we are to live self-controlled, and we're to wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that would be my three points in this textual lesson. I, I would uh, want to be able to see what he says we're to say no to, and then how we're to live, and then what we're to wait for. And he says in this passage that we are to say no to two things. We're to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And he says we are to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. And we are to wait for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't that make a great sermon? That, uh, you know, in this passage, we're to help people to uh, say no to certain things, then uh, not leave it there, but tell them what they're uh, to do, how they are to live, and then, you know, to wait on uh, certain things. Uh, it, there's ways that you're going to uh, find other passages now that's going to uh, support these three points. And uh, that's, you know, extremely important. So you need to read the text, and you need to make some notes, and go to some inspired authors and see how they've dealt with this particular subject. When I first started preaching, uh, sermon outline books and uh, sermons by uh, other people, uh, notes I had taken when I was listening to sermons, all of these things were extremely important, and I used them. Knowing how other people deal with the subject, you know, helps me uh, to uh, see that I'm dealing with it the way I, I ought to deal with it. Now, it doesn't mean that all the people I'm going to look at and all the information I'm going to receive from it is always going to be correct but it is going to help me. Uh, you know, I, I see statements that's going to uh, help me to explain, uh, you know, these uh, passages and even, you know, to define, you know, what's being said or to amplify uh, the subject. Now, I wasn't embarrassed to uh, say that, you know, I used uh, uh, someone's lesson to help me to develop, you know, my lesson uh, on these particular subjects. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, one thing that you need to do in addition to doing this study and using other people and using commentaries, you need to look for uh, those salient words, uh, the important words that just kind of leap off the page, that uh, jump at us, that reach out and grab us, you know, that are in the text. And we may want to define those words from a dictionary. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. People need to know what, uh, you know, these words mean. So feel free uh, to define these words. Go to a, a dictionary and uh, look them up. Uh, now, the dictionary doesn't always define them the way the Bible does. So if you have a use of a Greek-English lexicon, Use it also for definitions of words, and uh, you'll find this to be extremely help, helpful in uh, preparing your lesson. Uh, and they're easy. Uh, uh, English uh, Greek lexicon is easy to use. You can look up the English word that's in a text, and you can go and find in that lexicon where that word is being used and uh, it will give you a definition of that particular word. And uh, you know that that's the way the New Testament writers meant for that word to uh, be used because they've defined it, you know, from the Greek. And uh, we know that we're doing it the way that God intended for it to be done. Now, 
you also need to do uh, an extensive and intensive uh, reading of commentaries. Uh, I, I read commentaries. I want to see what other men had to say about these particular passages. And it's going to help me as uh, I try to prepare, you know, this particular lesson. And as I go through these commentaries, you know, I've got my pen, pencil, paper, and, and I'm writing down notes that's going to help me as I prepare this sermon. As I put this lesson together, uh, I know some things that other people had to say. Don't use just one commentary. Use uh, more than one commentary. And usually uh, the fellows that are already preaching, they have some of these books in their library, and they'd probably be happy for you to come down to their office and read through uh, some of these um, uh, books and commentaries. So you want to compare your analysis with their analysis. And uh, that'll help you to know that, hey, I'm preaching the truth on this particular subject. Now, you also, um, this is going to help you to develop a pattern for the sermon. Uh, I see how they develop the sermon. Now I have a general idea of how I want to develop the sermon. And this uh, is greatly enhanced by me looking at uh, different people and how they handle these subjects. Now, you also want to correlate your notes from these commentaries with your own independent study. Don't rely entirely upon what uh, the commentator has to say or, you know, what somebody's sermon outline is. You're studying along with these things. And as you study, you're developing, you know, your thoughts and ideas uh, of what it is teaching, and you're going to incorporate that into uh, this particular lesson. And you want to think of simple ways that you can illustrate uh, these uh, Bible truths. It's amazing, and you need to understand this, illustrations are extremely important uh, for uh, people understanding a truth because you take uh, some kind of uh, everyday experience or whatever, and uh, you uh, help people uh, to understand better uh, what, you know, this passage is teaching. Now, I've preached in a lot of different places, and uh, I go back to some of those places, and people will remind me of an illustration that I've used. And uh, one that uh, comes into mind real quickly, uh, talking about sin getting a hold of us. You know, uh, the Bible teaches that uh, we can get so involved in sin that, uh, you know, it gets a hold on us and won't let go. And I've used an illustration about uh, many, many years ago when uh, I smoked cigarettes and I was struggling to try and quit. And it was, it was extremely hard for me. Now, I did quit. My wife used to say, you make sure you tell people you quit. Well, I did quit. And that's been, I can't tell you how many years ago it was, probably close to 50 years ago now. But uh, it was a struggle for me. It had a hold of me, and it didn't want to let go. And sin does that. And I used an illustration uh, about this smoking that, you know, uh, I had one of these nicotine fits one night while I was going through the process of quitting. And uh, I went down to the store to buy a pack of cigarettes. And I, I went in, and I looked around to make sure that there was nobody there that I knew or anybody that knew me. And I went up to the clerk and I said, give me a pack of those. And it didn't anymore hit the counter till I had it uh, hid away in my pocket. And uh, I went out of the store and got in my car. Couldn't wait to tear open that pack of cigarettes. And uh, I uh, lit that thing and I began to draw on it. And so much so that I nearly passed out. And, and I was driving home and... Uh, I was so ashamed of what I had done 
uh, falling off the wagon like that. But as I was going down the road, going toward my house, I passed this field over on the, the side, right side of the automobile. And I rolled down the window of my automobile and I just threw the pack of cigarettes out into that field. Well, later that night, I had a, another one of these nicotine fits, but I didn't have any more money. I was broke, but I thought I could remember where I threw that pack of cigarettes out. And late at night, I went back to that spot, turned my car toward those uh, uh, bushes, and got out and began going through the bushes hunting that pack of cigarettes. And I found them. And, uh, of course, I, I went through about the same drill as I'd gone through before. But, you know, that's awful for something to get that kind of hold on you. And it, But it was a great illustration to talk to people that may be on drugs or may uh, be addicted to alcohol or maybe smoking. People will remember the illustration uh, even when they've forgotten the sermon. And that's how important you know, an illustration is. So you're going to find illustrations, personal experiences. I'm not ashamed to uh, use personal experiences. I, I try to tell people I've overcome uh, these things, but, uh, you know, I'm willing to share those with people. Uh, modern stories, they're good uh, to use, uh, are, you know, things that we get from uh, reading and studying. Uh, uh, I was uh, writing a bulletin article the other day and uh, talking about church attendance. And I used the illustration when I was a kid, I wanted to go to a ball game. But that ball game happened to be on a church night. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, can we go to this ball game? It's really important. And much to my surprise, he said, yes, that'd be all right. I said, okay. And I was excited. And he said, uh, before we buy the tickets, let me ask you a question. If the Lord were to come back tonight, would you want him to find you at church or would you want him to find you at the ball game? Uh, okay, we'll go to church. Uh, the decision was mine, uh, but it was a powerful illustration, and I used that in a bulletin article this past week. And you can use stories like that. That's a personal experience. You can use modern stories. I'm working on my next bulletin article, and it comes from a, a country music song uh, because there's some words in it that I can use to help people in uh, their life. And uh, it's uh, Kenny Chesney, and he uh, talks about it, uh, he was interviewing an old man and they were asking him uh, what the uh, secret to life was. And his remark was, don't blink. And he says that, you know, uh, I went to bed when I was six years old. I woke up when I was 25. Well, not literally, but when you blink, these things happen. And my point is, you know, we have children, uh that need us, uh, we have circumstances that we're involved in, and folks, don't blink. Those opportunities are going to get by you before you know it. Well, these are the kind of things you can use, and people remember those. They might not remember the point, but they'll remember the illustration that you use. Human interest stories or events. You know, look at your uh, newspaper. Um, the guy in a chronicle or uh, whatever it is that uh, you read. And when you read stories in there that you think would make a good illustration, you write those down and you use those. And uh, those are human interests that uh, people are going to remember that really are going to illustrate your point. And then probably uh, uh, more importantly is use Old Testament and New Testament stories. Nothing drives home a point better than an illustration, you know, from the Bible. Uh, 
you know, it was written that uh, those things written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And that's uh, referring to the uh, Old Testament. Those things have been written that's going to help us. So use those when you're putting together a sermon. And uh, those uh, Old Testament stories, New Testament stories, are going to be very profitable in uh, you developing uh, your lesson. Uh, then, uh, you know, you need to think of ways uh, that using the illustration and these truths that you can apply it that's going to help people. Now, most of the time I tell people, you know, this begins right here and goes that direction. I'm preaching at me as much as I'm preaching at my audience because I need these things just as much as they do. And if people understand that, I'm not preaching at you. You know, I'm preaching to help us, me as well as you, and that's important. Um, also, you know, as we are working on this sermon, we need to make a, a rough draft. Start with a rough draft, draft and then you begin to ref, uh, um, refine this into an a outline that you're going to be able to preach. And then, you know, I would suggest, and now you may not be able to do this in the very beginning, but I would suggest that you memorize that outline and then you practice it uh, orally and uh, know how the presentation is going to go. I did uh, later when I was uh, preaching, when I started out, I, I started out preaching from sheets of paper, you know, that were this size. And later I began to... Uh, minimize those to a little four by six card. I probably have one over here someplace that uh, you can see what I'm talking about. I would reduce it down to a card like this. And then I would memorize what was on that card. People would say, uh, boy, you don't use notes and it just pours off of you. I said, no, that's not true. You see, I've got my notes in my Bible. That is, uh, you know, if I get lost, uh, my memory's only so good, so if my memory fails me, I can go uh, look it up on my notes. But memorizing it makes you free in your preaching. And so you memorize it. As you practice it, you get better at delivering those lessons. And you'll find that to be, you know, extremely uh, important in time. Now, there's a lot of advantages to textual teaching and preaching. And primarily it's because all of the words are, of the text are going to be brought before the people. Now, this gives divine authority uh, to the message that you're preaching, and that's important. Uh, these are usually, you know, short text, and it's easier for the audience to retain uh, these short texts than it is when you go into uh, preaching uh, whole paragraphs, uh, it's more difficult for them to retain that. So the short text uh, uh, can be easily memorized by you and by your audience. So, you know, that's a real advantage. And it also, when you prepare textual sermons, it does make for a variety in preaching because you're going to be looking at different texts in the Bible and uh, you're going to be delivering lessons based upon that. And it's a good time, you know, to uh, take a number of different verses which uh, contain the same words or thoughts and bring them into that particular lesson. Now, other passages may combine to help uh, explain the truth of the uh, passage that you're emphasizing. And also, you know, it's uh, helpful to a uh, beginner who may not be able to, you know, preach from a simple text to be able to speak, you know, uh, briefly uh, from a number of texts and still feel that, you know, he's preaching the Word of God. And that's uh, extremely important. There's many of combinations like this that you can use in the text. Now, uh, once again, there are some disadvantages. And uh, when we use a text uh, to teach a lesson, 
you know, the unity of the Bible is not as apparent uh, as it is when we're teaching expository lessons. And that's the next thing we're going to be getting into. Uh, Texts which are selected here, uh, here and there throughout uh, the scriptures are likely to impress an audience with the uh, unity of the Bible as a whole. And they see that the Bible fits together because we use these texts that are teaching, uh, you know, somewhat the same thing. Uh, the Bible's made to appear to be uh, a book of isolated text if we're not careful in just using a verse or whatever all the time. And uh, we want to uh, make sure that people understand that uh, the Bible is a complete revelation, and that's important. Uh, the tendency of the textual preacher is to wear out his audience. So we have to be careful that, uh, you know, we don't uh, do that. Now, uh, some hints at preparing a textual sermon. You know, take a, a number of texts that lend themselves to a, a division and prepare an outline on them. Just do it for practice. Uh, faithfully study it. Uh, have a closing application and uh, do constant practice. Uh, and this will help you uh, in developing this type of sermon. Uh, anytime you prepare an outline, file it away for future use. You know, everything I've ever preached, I've got that outline somewhere. And, uh, you know, even that I can go back to from time to time that's going to be beneficial in helping me uh, to preach God's truth. And take notes on other preachers' treatments. Our son Kyle, every lesson he hears, he has a, a pad and his pen, and he's outlining that sermon. Now, he has all of that material. He don't get rid of it. He saves it. Uh, tomorrow, when you go uh, to uh, worship, have you a, a pen and a piece of paper and outline the preacher's sermon and then file it away. Don't throw it away. File it away. And you'll find that uh, there is a lot of use for that uh, as you go on. Now, we'll uh, look at uh, next week uh, a sample of a textual sermon. And I think it'll help you to see, you know, what it is that we're talking about. And I think you'll find that to be uh, extremely useful. Okay, I'm going to quit. You may want to discuss some of these things among yourselves. I would suggest that you do that. <clears throat> and uh, especially, uh, you know, talk about these things with the one who is uh, there um, overseeing uh, your class. And I think you'll find this to be extremely helpful. Keep us in mind as we're uh, up in uh, Nashville. This is a time that is very, very difficult for the Hazlip family. And um, uh, I would appreciate you uh, keeping them in mind. All right, until next week, may God bless you and keep you.